Hey guys, Abel here, and in the following video, you will see a pretty epic webinar slash Q&A that took place in the Sustainable Self Development Facebook group, which you're still more than welcome to join. It is linked in the show notes below. And this has been held by the legendary strength coach who now I'm proud to call a colleague, Berge Fagerli, on training for hypertrophy in a sustainable, burnout safe way. And in this webinar, you will hear all kinds of cool stuff about training volume, frequency and intensity, proximity to failure, making use of different strategies for training, such as those more focused on emphasizing metabolic stress and others that are more focused on mechanical loading and heavier training. And there were some more personalized Q and A's as well. There was also a recent back and forth between Berge and Brett Schoenfeld on Facebook on training volume because they don't quite see eye to eye on the recent evidence-based volume recommendations. So that will be covered as well. So this has been a really epic and extensive webinar. And if you're interested in seeing more stuff like this, then join the Sustainable Self-Development Facebook group because for the next four weeks, we actually plan to release something like this. So now is your chance to submit your questions if you join the group and the things you're interested in and we will do our best to answer your questions in the next four weeks. But if you're interested in this, then once again, you'll have to join the Facebook group. Also, if you're curious about delving into these training methodologies and tactics you'll be hearing about, then I'd like to tell you that we are actually currently working on a really cool training template, which will elaborate on these methods and you'll be able to implement it for yourself and it will be available for purchase. And if you'd like to get an early bird 20% discount on this upcoming product, then I encourage you to go to sustainableselfdevelopment.com. Don't worry, you don't need to buy anything yet or give any kind of credit card details or anything like that. You just need to fill in your email address and you will be notified when the product is out and you will be getting your 20% discount rate. So with that, without further ado, let's get into this Q&A webinar with Berge. Okay, so looking at the questions, there's a lot of overlap in, in uh, what you're asking about. So I, I think it's it's a good idea to just preface this uh, this whole Q and A with uh, just just a general overview of um, see how to make a muscle grow, and what principles should be in place, and and why I think that a lot of the the training principles uh, based on see the evidence based recommendations are are somewhat more nuanced that, than they seem to be um simply because they they might be lacking some some fundamental background um understanding of, of um of the demographics of the of the subject pool uh to 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 uh, to, to sort of um yeah I'm going to explain this, so so just bear with me. Okay, so I have a, I have a few notes here. I'm just going to bring them up here, so I can I can stay on topic. Now, see the 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 the, the whole process of hypertrophy here is when a contracting muscle is experiencing like a sudden and dramatic shift in in the internal environment. There's like a significant distortion in the stretch of, uh, of the mechanical structures of the muscle fibers. And uh, there's like a metabolic stress depending on how many reps you're doing, like, uh, like a change again in the, in the internal environment. The, the, the pH value and, and um, a lot of um, buildup of the metabolic uh, uh, end, uh, and uh, oh my God, what's what's the word for it? End product of the metabolic process, uh, and the subsequent anabolic signaling within within the cell uh, that leads to the the muscle growth process is is like a response to the sudden and dramatic change. Now, for for long term training, there there does seem to be uh, like a, a couple of very essential things, and and you might have heard of them before. It's uh, the myonuclei, the myonuclei, myonuclear domain. Uh, which is simply how many um, cell cores there are within the muscle fiber. So to to make a muscle cell or a muscle fiber larger, you need more myonuclei. Uh, I have discussed this before in my MyReps article series and my high-frequency training uh, series. And, and so you can see the difference between the responders and non-responders to training because that's sort of what we have to deal with uh, with the training research. And that's highly related to, to the number of satellite cells 
in, in the tissue. And these satellite cells, their activity, um, uh, basically in response to training and how readily they are donating the, the myonuclei to the muscle cell and thus increasing the size. Uh, you also have the translational capacity of the cell uh, where uh, ribosomal biogenesis is important. So, so basically just how rapidly, uh, how rapidly the workers can, can build new, uh, new mass, new muscle mass. That, that seems to be uh, very important. Um, okay, so th there are like various pathways involved in muscle growth, um, but, but they, they seem to sort of run in parallel or, and aren't necessarily additive. I mean, there's, um, you, you can sort of um, put them into two major categories, like the mechanical side of things and the metabolic side of things. Now, there are some discussions, I know, between Menno and Brad and, and uh, several researchers and authorities whether uh, metabolic stress is just a way to enhance the me mechanical stress um, or whether they are separate processes. I, I tend to think that it's, it's both. It's not either or. Um, I, I do think that uh, the metabolic stress in itself is an important uh, stimulus. Uh, but also keep in mind that whatever stimulus you apply to a muscle, it will adapt to eventually. And the mechanical stimulus is also very important. I would probably say the most important, uh, just sort of how strongly you pull on the, the muscle fiber, uh, whether it be with a passive stretch. We've seen muscle growth just by stretching muscles um, or whether you are act actively contracting the muscle. Now, the, the pathways tend to run in parallel and aren't additive, and, and, and the bottleneck in muscle growth isn't really the number of pathways you can activate. The, the bottleneck will be like uh, the translational capacity, uh, as mentioned, and the myonuclei um, of the muscle cell. So these are important processes, and, and we can see that they tend to become... Now, I'm, I'm still, I still don't have all the answers. I've discussed this at length with Brian Haycock, who just recently uh, published or... Um, uh, he wrote a dissertation on the topic, uh, and, and we still don't have like a lot of good data uh, to, to um, you know, we, we do know what makes satellite cells activate and, and uh, even reactive activate if they've been dormant for a while. But, but uh, the translational capacity, there's, there's evidence that metabolic stress will induce it. Um, and there's evidence that heavy mechanical loading will induce it. So how to sort of make all of this fit together. I have a working theory and, and some principles that, that I find to be very effective. And, and I'm sort of good, just gonna provide you with a framework. And, and as mentioned, we are, um, we're planning to release a program that will sort of put this into action and, and make it easy to follow and, and understand hopefully. Uh, and that's gonna be released uh, later uh, this fall. So probably August, I have set a deadline for August 15th and I hope to be ready with everything there. Um, so you, what you can do if you want to, uh, to sort of have an early bird or early adopter um, invite or, or so we're just going to give you a discount on this stuff because we really want you to improve your training. So if you just go to sustainabledevelopment.com, uh, basically the name of the Facebook group, .com, then you can uh, just register your name. We're not going to spam you or send you any uh, bullshit. You're just going to get a discount code, and, and you can use it or not. That's sort of up to you. Uh, OK, so um, both low and high loads will cause enough disruption or, or trauma to unconditioned tissue that it will respond with muscle growth. This, this is important when you, uh, like looking at all the research, um, there are like studies showing uh, high loads will work, low loads will work, um, and they tend to work equally well, uh, but uh, you always have to remember that how effective any load is depends on the condition of the muscle tissue at the time you apply that load. And so the previous training needs to be taken into account. Uh, you also have to uh, take into account how much time has passed since the previous training bout. Some studies use, use a washout protocol where uh, people are told to rest for like a couple of weeks. And we know that resting a muscle will restart muscle growth and, and can even enhance muscle growth. And, and so a period of rest is also going to be an important part of the training process, in my opinion. 
the, the ability of the tissue to respond uh, with muscle growth to a training stress is uh, due to genes, to your age, your training age, nutrition, hormones, rest, stress, even circadian rhythms. I mean, there's so many things involved here and, and you're sort of always gonna work with a moving target, which may, sort of makes it difficult. But um, fr from my perspective and my experience working with uh, several thousand clients throughout the years of all levels of advancement and, and just sort of observing not only my own experience, but but also those of um, that that of um, like old time trainees, like back before steroids came on the scene, uh, and, and there is a lot of good research from the fifties and sixties and seventies. I don't think we should discount that research and, and just sort of think or say that well, this is a recent study; it was just published, and so we should just sort of uh, forget all previous research. No, we need, we sort of need to fit fit it into into a uh, uh, in, into the picture to, to sort of understand everything. Uh, we also have to take into account, again, how trained the person is. So, so there's a, gonna, always going to be a difference between untrained, moderately trained, or recreationally trained, and uh, like some of you guys that have been lifting weights for many, many years. And so there, there's like all sorts of things that should be taken into account. Um, and there are various ways to progress the overload. Say, um, if you've been lifting the same weight and reps for a, a few times, then um, the muscle is going to lose, uh, or, or that load and that rep range, and that volume is going to lose effectiveness. And there's like two major ways to increase uh, the volume or, or the ability to, to, um, of that muscle to respond. You can increase the weight and or you can increase the volume or time under load, time under tension, whatever you want to call it. Now, I recommend that, that you, you sort of um, focus on progressive load increase. I have found this to be, to be the most uh, important part of building a larger muscle. Um, and it's simply a better way to, to enhance the disruptive potential of the load on, on the tissue. I mean, there, there's like, um, by just increasing volume over time, you sort of, uh, yes, you're going to grow a larger muscle due to that, but uh, it's, it's, there's going to be a threshold for time and tension that must be reached for anabolic signaling, but there's also going to be a point of diminishing returns and even detrimental effect with volume. Uh, and, and also keep in mind that, that uh, while you can observe muscle, increased muscle protein, uh, protein synthesis after a workout, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get muscle growth from it, because if if you have if you see actual muscle damage or inflammation, then that MPS response is simply a marker for repair or remodeling, and you're not going to get muscle growth until that repair or remodeling uh, is complete. Um, Okay, so there's a question. Would you say the main reason for non-responders is less sensitivity to satellite cell activation and donation processes? Yes, that does seem to be uh, one of the reasons why. But again, there, there can be multiple factors involved. Um, nutrients, age, uh, anabolic resistance, um, several things. But, but again, like when we're working with sort of a moving target and an organism, we, we, we sort of always have to analyze or reflect on, on, on the current condition of that tissue and what it takes to sort of um, bring about a disruptive process. Uh, now, there, there's good reason to believe that you can grow muscle training a muscle just once per week. And, and obviously people have been doing that for, for a long, long time. Uh, and given enough time, it's possible that, that you know, they would end up at the same point that if, as if they had trained more frequently, uh, especially if you're, adding pharmaceutical assistance to the mix, which has been, you know, the use of steroids the last 20 to 30 years has been very um, rampant in the fitness community and bodybuilding. Um, so keeping in mind that, that protein synthesis or actual muscle growth only happens after all the damage has been repaired, I, I tend to think that more frequent, less damaging training is a better way to go about muscle growth in the, in the long term. Uh, now to, to actually, like some of you guys have asked about my high frequency recommendations and, and you sort of have to keep in mind that when I wrote that article, I, I, uh, I used a very important part of that and that was like daily undulating periodization. Uh, 
training more frequently than two to three times per week uh, should should be focused on metabolic stress, like higher ups and loss of burn. Uh, and there's like research using blood flow restriction, like occlusion training, uh, where they're training muscle groups twice per day, every day, and, and you can see pretty dramatic muscle growth. But that muscle growth tends to plateau after 10 to 14 days. So uh, th there's sort of a limit to how, how much muscle growth you can get out of high rep training. Uh, you can also do skill-based submaximal work uh, in the way that powerlifters are doing. And, and this goes back to the Norwegian Frequency Project, where they noticed uh, the, the pretty significant improvement in the group training six days per week. And, and uh, a large part of that was simply that the three-day-per-week group had such a high volume that uh, it, it, it basically, you know, it destroyed them. So, so splitting that volume uh, over six days was a better way to handle that high volume of training. And they also do a lot of sub-maximal training, meaning they can do sets of three, four, or five reps uh, with their six to 10 rep max. So, so just sort of doing four to five sets with that, and, and they might not even approach failure on any of those sets. So, so that, those are ways to implement higher frequency training if you, would, if you wanted to. Uh, okay, so there, there's been like a lot of engagement and questions around my recommendations for basically two to three sets, two to three times per week. And again, it, this flies in the face of a lot of uh, like Brad Schoenfeld's uh, work and, and uh, Menno Hanselmans that I've been collaborating with and, and he's a good friend of mine for many, many years. And, and I, I think it bears repeating that I don't disagree that higher volume can build muscle faster. But um, the name of this group is sustainable self-development and, and I find um, so, so let, let's say that, that you sort of, um, you're working on a continuum here. So on the dose response curve here, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's also kind of weird that only recent studies are showing, uh, sort of the, the, like a huge advantage to higher volume training. When, when you go back and look at research from like the 60s, 70s and 80s, it was for a long time, uh, like, like sort of a, um, I wouldn't say common knowledge, but but there wasn't that large of a difference between one set as long as you took that set to failure and three sets, for instance. Like high volume didn't have that huge advantage. So so I'm kind of skeptical what is creating this huge advantage. And it might just very well be that uh, it's creating so much inflammation that you're actually measuring uh, a cross-sectional area with the measurement methods they're using today simply because there's more inflammation. And I know uh, this is something a lot of you have experienced. If you take like one week of uh, uh, rest or two weeks even, uh, you probably freak out because it, it looks like you're shrinking on a daily basis. Now we know that contractile tissue can be maintained for two to three weeks with, with uh, very little loss in, in actual muscle. But what you are losing is sort of the, the swelling and the swelling from inflammation. So is it actual muscle growth you're observing or, or is it uh, like just swelling? Temporary swelling. Um, I tend to think the, the latter, of course. Uh, and again, the dose response curve, uh, again, this is, this is like an aggregate of, of the research I have looked at, where some of the real high volume studies where you uh, saw like dramatic muscle growth from 30 to 40, 45 sets per week, those were exactly the metabolic stress occlusion training studies uh, I was talking about where you again are creating a huge metabolic stress factor, uh, high reps, lots of burn, uh, really low loads, blood occlusion cuffs, um, and it's, it's usually short-term studies. They're not long-term studies. And, and even going back to, there's a book I really love. Um, it, it's, it's written by a, a guy called Hedinger. He's an East German researcher, and, and uh, knowing the East Germans and what they did um, during that time, they, they were able to have like thousands of uh, subjects uh, just for studying like strength and muscle growth, uh, simply because they wanted to dominate. Uh, it was important politically to dominate in sports back then. And, and, and um, they have shown pretty consistently that high trainability, meaning that uh, for some people you can observe very rapid growth for from eight to 12 weeks of training with higher volumes, higher loads, just sort of extreme training protocols. But 
almost without exception, these subjects also experience stagnation and overreaching and overtraining. Uh, they had aches and pains, they had injuries, uh, uh, and if they didn't, muscle growth and strength gains just simply stopped and it started regressing. Uh, and this is what I have seen in my experience. Uh, I mean, I've had people, uh, yeah, can you write down the book you mentioned? It's called Hepzinger, sorry, Physiology of Strength. You can find it as a PDF, free PDF file online. So just came through that. Like there's a lot of isometric research. But uh, what was surprising about that was they, they, they pretty much saw the, the same growth potential from 50 to 60% loads as 100% loads. They observed uh, similar muscle and strength gains with uh, really low volume, like equaling 10 to 15 total reps. Uh, they saw the best gains with high frequency training. But again, these were isometric protocols. So you didn't create a lot of muscle damage. So I would say the more muscle damage you create, uh, the less frequently you can train. And, and um, this is probably why the, the really low frequency, like one, uh, one workout per week per muscle group uh, works so well, because you're sort of just doing a, a lot of volume in, in that workout, and you're spending a few days repairing that damage, you're getting some muscle growth out of it, and you're, you're partially desensitizing the tissue because it's getting some rest, and so it will respond even better. Uh, when you train it uh, a week later, but but I tend to think that spreading that volume over more workouts uh, tends to work better uh, for for many reasons. Now again, back to uh, looking at all of those volume recommendations and, and, uh, and how many sets per week should you do, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, for sure you can grow faster, uh, but I have seen too many times, and also from the feedback I got from my recent Facebook posts both in private and on Facebook, that this is the experience of a lot of people out there. And this is simply because um, the adaptive response is also depending, dependent on the recovery process. And if you have anything going on in your life limiting your recovery, uh, whether it be lack of rest, lack of, uh, or, or too much stress in your life, uh, lack of uh, consistent sleep routines, even lack of proper circadian rhythms, uh, some occasional alcohol, perhaps your nutrition isn't on point. Uh, you have a family, you have a social life. Hopefully, a lot of you have a, a social life. Uh, and all of this, like life gets in the way of optimal all the time. So, so the reason for my recommendations is simply that if you can get, th this, is, this is the Pareto principle in, in action. With 20% of the time investment, you can get 80% of the results. And accumulating that over a longer period of, the, period of time where you're just you know, loving your workouts because you're not tired all the time and fatigued or in pain. And, and you're training effectively. You're not just you know, doing volume for volume's sake. You're going in, hitting the weights, getting in that disruption of the tissue, uh, just basically hit it hard and go home and, and recover. And, and even if you're sacrificing, so 20% of uh, the time investment and effort, maybe not effort because you're still going to have to push yourself in the gym, um, getting in more effective reps, you, you guys know that uh, effective reps is, is simply just getting uh, the load to, to do its maximal uh, effect on the tissue. I, I like to, to use my reps training, obviously. Um, and even if you're just getting 80% of the gains, does that mean that if you were to chase 100% by quadrupling your volume, that you would end up becoming bigger in the end? No, I don't think so because there's gonna be a genetic and biological limit to how big you can get. And if you plan to be training for more than one or two years, then I would suggest that you uh, pick a combination of frequency uh, sets and reps that allows you to keep training for many, many years and enjoy training. Now, 80% will eventually accumulate and, and get you as big as you could possibly be, but with much less hassle along the way. Now, of course, a lot of you guys just love being in the gym. You love training. You get an endorphin rush out of it. You get a dopamine rush out of it. And, and uh, 
just keep doing what you're doing. But but at some point, I think it bears reflecting on: uh, are, are you actually uh, do, do you have any results to show for all of that effort? And and I also like to ask people: Would you spend your money the same way? If you can get 80% returns on on a 20% investment, why would you go to 100%? Or like an additional 80%, why would you quadruple your investment to get a meager like 10 to 15%? Because you you would rarely, if ever, get 100% gains. Um, and, and I know that I wouldn't from an economical perspective. Now let's see if I have covered. Like the nervous system requires its own recovery and research has shown that it can take as long as seven days for baseline strength to return following an unaccustomed heavy or high volume workout. Now the right frequency at any given time will depend on the balance of the mechanical stress, the metabolic stress, and the nervous system stress you are creating balanced with your life stress. So again, if, if you're someone that's not like so devoted to this training thing that you're gonna compete and it's your life dream to become a Olympia or you're a professional athlete or, or uh, you have hormonal assistance or whatever, um, or genetics allowing you to, to just grow as a weed, then, then in my mind, I think a more reasonable combination of volume and frequency would, would be better. Um, and also, I, I, I tend to believe, I've, I've sort of gone in circles, and, and I'm basically back to where I was in 2002 when I uh, wrote a lot of stuff for the hypertrophy-specific training board. I've recently had some discussions with Brian Haycock and he's written an awesome dissertation on this and and I sort of tend to think that there's a value to the progressive loading there's value to just keeping a moderate like the two to three sets two to three times per week per muscle group kind of thing um, and again knowing uh, Martin Birkin he's a good friend of mine um, He's been creating awesome results in, in a lot of his, you know, his followers for, for many, many years. And his, his cutting routine is two sets one time per week per muscle group. And his bulking routine is three to six sets. Or, or like, yeah, three sets one to two times per week per muscle group. Um, and there, there are plenty of other uh, like uh, examples, real world examples of, of uh, being able to build amazing physiques with more moderate training approaches. So, so all I'm saying that I, I agree with Brad Schoenfeld and Menno that higher volumes and, and uh, more training can, uh, can probably provide a higher rate of growth. We don't know if that applies to everyone, whether everyone can uh, recover from that beyond the 8 to 12 week point that most studies are done. And, and in my opinion, a lot of people can't simply because life happens. Um, I also don't think just grinding and wearing yourself out in the gym just because you want to chase the absolute maximum all the time. Uh, and and um, and being on the brink of overreaching, overtraining, the maximum recoverable volume uh, concept of Mike Ishutel, for example, I, I I just tend to think that's that's a very poor rate of uh, return of investment. So by moving back on the scale, you can you know you will avoid a lot of these issues that tend to pop up at the very higher end of the threshold. Uh, getting more effective reps, shorter workouts. I mean, for me personally, some of my workers are, are like in the 30 to 45 minute range. Uh, I work out every, yeah, three to four days sometimes. And for me, I'm, I'm as close to my genetic potential as I can probably get. And, and I just feel a lot better. And, and I have even seen some muscle growth from this. And uh, this is what I tend to see in my clients as well. And, and believe me, I get a lot of clients that come from the really high volume and also high frequency approaches and are just, you know, there's a, it's a huge mind fuck that I put him on a program with uh, just two to three sets, two to three times per week. And as Abel also said in his uh, YouTube video, um, this was very hard for him to, to actually go through with and trust, but, but he did and he experienced some, some pretty amazing results from it. Okay, so let me get to the questions. I believe I have answered uh, 
some of these already. Uh, first question, what kind of program would be best suitable or most optimal for a four day a week pro program, about one hour max each session? Okay, so it's basically the same thing that, that I've been talking about here. I would you know, say maybe an upper low split. Um, I tend to think that you should progress from like say two weeks of rest, just to sort of reset the sensitivity. This is interesting because we have good research showing that not even can you restart muscle growth after a period of rest after it has stagnated at a given uh, training protocol. But there are also studies showing more rapid growth when you come back to training after a two week rest period. I wouldn't stretch it to three weeks that some studies have used. I would try to probably stay around the 10 to 12, maybe 14 day point as that sort of, uh, as long as you can wait before you start to initiate the loss of muscle mass. So the only thing you're gonna lose is glycogen, uh, glycogen stores and, and inflammation. Uh, but at that point, uh, which is exactly the point that a lot of the studies are being done from, uh, you can get very rapid muscle growth from really light uh, loads. I would probably start at 40 to 50% of your uh, current one rep max and just do my reps. And, and uh, uh, with the lighter loads, you can uh, do high frequency. So a four day uh, per week program could be a full body uh, routine. Um, and then as you get into heavier loading, cause I would, you're gonna see this in, in action when we create the program, I would just consistently increase loads until like a basic linear periodization model. Uh, and then progress through the metabolic stress part of the training cycle and gradually go into the mechanical stress part of the, uh, of the training cycle. So over a 12 to maybe 16 week period, you just basically um, drop reps as loads increase. And once you get into heavy loading, like around the five to 10 RM range, you can, um, reduce the frequency per muscle group. So you would do an upper lower split and you would do maybe even cluster training. You would uh, sort of try to diminish or reduce the metabolic component because you sort of want to unload and rest that, that part and focus more on like just heavy, heavy loading and compound lifts. Uh, that, that's just a brief overview and, and uh, I apologize if that was confusing, but it's the best I can do in, in the Q and A. So, so I'm gonna get, uh, get back with more details later. Now, what things made me start implementing high frequency training, scientific findings, and especially experiences with his clients? Yes, all of those. The high frequency project, discussions with Matthias Wernbaum, uh, looking at the occlusion training and, and what you could create with the, uh, the, the low load training. Um, but, but again, it's, it's a part of a, bigger, uh, of a bigger picture. So I don't use high frequency training exclusive, ex exclusively or for everyone. It, it's, Depends on whether you can actually recover from it and, and your training status. Uh, what do you think of extreme high volume, high frequency training far away from failure uh, to bring up certain muscle groups? Well, if you wanted to do high volume, you would necessarily have to limit uh, reps or, or do more reps to failure. Um, but again, why? <laughs> uh, sure, I, I find high potential of value in, in like uh, occlusion type training or my rep training at low loads. And you can do a high frequency of that training, but um, most studies again show that after 10 to 14 days, uh, things start to uh, stagnate. So it's not gonna work forever. And again, it creates a lot of inflammation. It takes some time to recover from that. And, and is it actual muscle growth? Yes, there are some actual muscle growth. There are some mechanisms involved in, in um, satellite cell activity and ribosomal biogenesis and all that cool stuff. Um, but again, it needs to be part of, um, and I also tend to think that you might even compromise results if you combine heavy loading and metabolic stress in the same workouts. Even if there are studies showing that uh, it's effective, I believe it's a, more a function of, um, of the added volume, not necessarily the combination of those, because we don't have any good studies showing that. Um, have you had experience with extreme outliers in terms of protocols that typically typically don't work, random examples, someone getting significantly better gains by generally training far away from failure and or with very low volume. Yes, I uh, was part of developing the neurotyping uh, theory or methodology with Christian Thibodeau. We had a lot of good discussions on that and I believe there, there are differences in, in uh, work tolerance and recovery capacity 
which means that some people should probably train with slightly higher volumes uh, and can even tolerate higher frequencies. But but this is on such an individual level that um, I, I have certain ways of figuring that out. But it, but a good way to uh, I mean, you know yourself better than an, uh, anyone, and you probably know whether you feel better or enjoy or respond better to higher reps versus lower reps. Most people can do both and feel fine, but some just, you know, they can go on forever at high reps, but as soon as they get into heavier loads, they start to suffer. And I think, I think for everyone, you should go through uh, at least one cycle or phase where you build up from uh, light loads to heavy loads and go through different rep ranges simply to see where do you sort of uh, thrive. And, and that can, you know, lay some groundwork for, for later training cycles. So you would perhaps focus more on, um, on, on the higher up phases and less on the lower up phases uh, and, and vice versa. Um, and and your, wor your, your work tolerance, if, if you are a guy that can do like a set of 15 and then on the next set you can do at least 14, maybe even 15 with, with the same load. I have seen people be able to do like sets of 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, just incredible uh, volume tolerance and and these are also usually the people that can get away with this higher volume but again should you i'm not so sure there there's again a, just a, a point of diminishing returns uh after how many sets per week per muscle group do you usually start seeing diminishing returns for your clients and does that number change for different muscle groups the short term again you can get away with very high volume and frequencies uh, i mean high frequency is also just a way of splitting up volume uh, in the long term, I tend to get the best results with my previously mentioned recognition of two, two to three sets, two to three times per week. Uh, the upper limit tends to be around maybe 12 to 15 sets per, per week per muscle group. Uh, this is the point where most people sort of um, have more issues with life getting in the way of optimal, to put it that way. How many sets per muscle group per week are generally enough to maintain muscle mass if you're in a deficit? I would say one to two sets. You, you can, uh, there, there are plenty of studies showing you can, you can drop volume by 70 to 80% from your current uh, plan and, and still maintain muscle mass. You can train once every seven to 10 days in general and still maintain muscle mass. If the deficit is very large, um, so, so the available energy at any one time is the rate at which you can uh, mobilize fatty acids and glycogen, obviously, during training, and the incoming calories. So if the sum of those, the sum of the mobilized body fat and the incoming calories isn't able to cover that deficit, you're probably going to start losing muscle mass uh, or have a higher risk of losing muscle mass. So just keep that in mind. Now, weight training will send a stronger signal to, to maintain muscle mass, but um, again, I, I think I just answered the question. Um, comments on Krieger's latest volume recommendations. I know you guys spoke about it briefly, uh, but any other comments would be cool. I believe I have answered that question thoroughly with this Q&A. Are there cases where you would say that a frequency of one day per muscle group per week is better than two or three times? Yes, uh, when cutting. I would say that would be uh, probably a good idea. You, you don't need to train with a higher frequency, but I like training with a higher frequency. Um, and also, if you're only able to go to the gym maybe twice a week, then that would could be a frequency you could uh, entertain. Um, Next one, many evidence-based professionals advocate an increase in volume with advancement in training age due to a reduced anabolic hormonal response to training, uh, resistance to muscle damage and muscular fatigue. Do you agree with this stance? Yes, in general, I do, uh, but I tend to uh, favor an increased frequency to allow the higher volume. Um, but but you, again, should you? If, if you want to compete and you are a professional, uh, if you're elite and, and, and this is important to you, if, if, if it's important to you to gain another half kilo of muscle mass the next year, then, then for sure, that's an investment you would probably be both comfortable doing and, uh, you know, um, accept the, the potential consequences of that. 
Recently, he and Brad Schoenfeld had an interesting back and forth exchange on volume. Can you summarize Brad's point of view based on that discussion and why he thinks the interpretation of the research is, I don't know uh, what the rest here is, uh, it's, it's missing from this text. Um, well, uh, basically Brad seems to be of the opinion that because uh, a higher volume will provide an, uh, an extra three to 5% uh, of muscle growth, then you should be doing that. And, and all I'm saying is that I think it should be left to the individual to, to actually reflect whether that's an investment they're willing to make. And uh, from my experience and also just looking at all the research and, and the subjects of those studies and, and uh, talking with uh, people I respect highly in the field um, that ha tend to have more moderate views, Jerry Melanick and Brian Haycock, to, to name two of them. And also Martin Birkin, who's also been working with a lot of uh, clients over the, over the years. I stand by my recommendations. How to lift without gaining size, or alternatively, how to train as a model is one question I, I got. And um, basically do the opposite of what I said. Just limit your volume, limit your frequency. Train once a week with maybe two to three sets, very submaximal work, just on pump. To, to sort of, uh, I don't know, get the pump. Uh, there's no need to uh, put a lot of effort into training. Effort seems to be very important if you want to grow muscle. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that's what I would do. Just a very minimal routine, uh, or just use light weights and, and pump, if, uh, just to sort of expand calories or, or, you know, pump up for a photo shoot. But yeah, how to get the biceps to peak? I'm sorry, but if, if you've been training for many years, you can't alter the change or, or change the shape of your muscle. You can only grow a larger muscle. There's no way you can grow the outer or inner head preferentially. Uh, I mean, the weights you're lifting with the reps you're doing, they're just gonna make the muscle grow as a whole. There's a very small chance that you can make some part of it grow more than the other. So um, again, you, you have the muscle you have and, and perhaps you can make it larger, but probably don't, not. Exercises to achieve pull-ups, if you can't do pull-ups. Um, I, I like doing eccentrics, where you just jump up and lower yourself under control. That's one way of doing it, it's an overload method. Uh, so even though a lot of uh, experts tend to disagree, I tend to think that you should at least build the muscles involved in doing pull-ups with the just pull-downs. You can hang from the bar and just do the lat contractions. So, so you sort of build yourself up to pull higher and higher. So combine that with the eccentric training where you jump up and control on the way down. Be very careful because this is a highly damaging training protocol. So you, you're gonna be sore as hell if you overdo it. Uh, but, but those are, I can generally get people from doing no push, uh, pull ups to uh, at least two or three within four to six week, weeks just by doing this. And, and here, since pull-ups tend to be a, a skill-based exercise, then, then just doing a high frequency of work, like doing a few reps here and there, if you have a pull-up bar at home, uh, just hanging from it, uh, just doing a half rep or something, um, can enhance your strength pretty dramatically. Okay, so I went way beyond the a lot of time and um, I warned you, so I, I hope it wasn't too much rambling. I have answered the questions I had um, time for, so we're just gonna have to, we're just gonna have to collect more questions and uh, like I told you, we're gonna keep doing a weekly Q&A here. Next time, hopefully, we, we might have to record it or do a YouTube, uh, Google Hangout kind of thing, uh, since we can't have me and Abel on at the same time. It would be good to sort of shoot back and forth where he asks me questions and I answer them. But um, I, I hope it was enlightening and informative and, and that you understand my perspective. And, and again, I'm, I'm not just saying this based on my bias or interpretation of like a couple of studies. I have been in the field for 20 years work with the thousands, thousands of people, and, and uh, I have seen the research, but, but I have also worked with people and, and, and um, in real life, under le real life conditions. I, I just believe that there's a better way to, to invest your, your effort, uh, a smarter way to invest your effort and still get as close to your genetic potential as your biology will allow. 
And, and by having just great workouts, short and effective workouts, using the most effective exercises, the most effective training methods, most effective progression model, you can squeeze the most muscle gains out of a training cycle and, and, and still just spend two to three days uh, in a gym per week or up to four days. Uh, I, I would probably consider spending more time with family and friends if you uh, ever wanted to to be every day in the gym or do different activities, not not just lift weights. So yeah, thank you so much for watching and uh, thanks for all the compliments here and I'll see you guys in uh, in a week. All right guys, so that was the webinar slash Q&A with Berge. And once again, if you're interested in seeing more stuff like this, if you would like to be notified when live Q&As like this will come out, or if you would like to submit questions on your own so that we can answer them, then be sure once again to join the Sustainable Self-Development Facebook group, which is linked in the show notes. And again, if you would like to claim your 20% discount early bird price for an upcoming training program, which will be covering a lot of these training methodologies and strategies that you just heard about, then head over to sustainablecelldevelopment.com and you can claim your discounted price. So once again, I hope you enjoyed this webinar and I hope to see you very soon.